In this segment, I would like to talk about specifically the vertical compaction obturation technique. I have chosen to use a set of simple graphics because it allows me as a teacher to be a better educator. In another show, different from this segment, we will demonstrate these techniques on a patient of record. Well, there's a lot of uh, popular techniques that have been spoken about, written about, and discussed across the world. And certainly this list would probably capture most of the most important ones. Obviously, I did not put down pace fillers because to me there is no reason or logic to use a cytotoxic paste when we have clearly better choices. Perhaps the most popular technique in the world today is single cone. I'm a little bit saddened by that because it is so popular, but it doesn't allow us to really mold that cone to pick up uh, the necessary hydraulics with the sealer to fill root canal systems. But it is, in fact, an expedient technique, and no doubt that has contributed to its popularity. Lateral condensation, historically and traditionally, has been the most popular technique taught in dental schools across the world. Vertical compaction was first introduced by Dr. Herb Schilder. Dr. Schilder talked about this in his famous article in Dental Clinics of North America in 1967. And this technique is the one I'm going to describe. Also very popular and increasing in use is carrier-based obturation. This is a technique that Cliff Ruddle does endorse, and I understand that probably causes grave concern for some of my endodontic friends around the world. It is a completely controlled three-dimensional technique. The only caveat would be in well-shaped canals. And the extrusion technique is uh, done by a very limited number of disciples. And my friend John Stropko first uh, introduced this technique many years ago, but this is a technique where we do not fit a cone. We basically just shape a canal, and then we take a injectable device like the Calamus Flow, and we can syringe thermosoften gutta percha into the apical one-third, and a plugger then can deliver that laterally and vertically into the apical one-third of the root. Let's talk about vertical compaction. Well, as you would expect, we fit a cone. And we fit a non-standardized master cone, and whatever system you're using to shape canals, that means a mechanical system, there's typically a matching master cone of gutta percha. Again, being a pro taper advocate for the last decade, I'm fitting a master cone that corresponds specifically to the pro taper finishing files. We always fit a cone in a wet canal, as I've mentioned earlier. We do take a radiograph to verify and confirm all the operative steps to date. I do fit the cone to the radiographic terminus, RT, recognizing the cone is minutely long. If we look at the apical extent of the cone in a higher magnification, I want to bring your attention to trimming the cone back, or what we call cutback. And cutting the cone back is based on where the true foramen is, where the physiologic terminus actually is, and this can be determined very accurately with paper point drawing. So that part of the paper point that is consistently dry is that part of the paper point that is inside the canal. The part of the paper point that extends beyond the foramen will typically spot, it could be red, a blood exudate, or it could be a clear exudate, and when you push the apical extent of a paper point against your gloved fingernail, the end of the paper point will oftentimes just accordion or collapse a little bit. Again, we're measuring that part of the rigid paper point because that is the true and final working length, and the cone then is cut back to that precise point. You're not going to move this cone, even when it's thermal softened, apically in well-shaped canals. In fact, Schilder said there is no force on the planet to move a cone through the foramen when you have four things in place. Number one, you have to have deep shape. Schilder always advocated deep shapes on the order of eight, nine, and ten percent. It's the deep shape 
that grabs the cone. So when the cone is thermal softened, it mushes up and grabs those walls and those tapered walls confines, holds, and restricts the apical movement of the cone. So number one is we have to have the deep shape. Number two, we have to have a good cone fit. As you can see here, the cone has apical tugback. We do not have uh, the cone engaging dentin away from its terminus. That would be called artificial tugback. And if you seat the cone and lift it up and seat the cone and lift it up and seat the cone and lift it up, what you'll be looking for when you remove the cone are little indentations and rub marks right at the terminus of the cone. If you see indentations, striations, scratches, or skid marks up in the body of the cone, that's a clear signal that you have artificial tugback. We have to fit pluggers. Schilder said that we must fit our pluggers so that they're always loose within the canal. We have to fit a largest plugger that works passively over a range of a few millimeters in the coronal one-third. We would size up a smaller diameter plugger whose working in allows it to progress passively through a range of a few millimeters in the middle one-third of the canal. And finally, we want a smaller plugger that will fit within five millimeters of the overall working length. That was the third objective where Schilder said there is no force on the planet to move gutta percha through the foramen if we have the shape, if we have the cone fit, and if we keep the pluggers and the heat source back five millimeters. There's no reason in warm gutta percha to move any plugger, electric or manual, closer than the five millimeter mark. So from a practical standpoint, to go through this graphically before we look at a clinical op, let's go through the steps, kind of like in the locker room, looking at X's and O's. So you'll dry the canal with paper points as we discussed. You'll identify the true working length. The cone is trimmed back accordingly. The cone is lubricated with sealer and slid to place. Once the cone is slid to pace, I remove that cone and I inspect it to make sure the cone is still lubricated, circumferentially, radicularly. If in fact the cone is lubricated, I tease it back to place and packing can commence. If in fact the cone is denuded or devoid of sealer in its radicular length, then I simply rebutter the cone lightly and then tease this cone to length. Once the cone is to length, we can use our electric heat transfer unit and we can sear off the non-useful butt end of the cone. Notice graphically I'm depicting a deeper orange color and that is depicting heat transfer. Heat transfer will move through a cone four to five millimeters. Four to five millimeters is the heat transfer of thermal softened gutta percha. Thermal softened gutta percha has compaction potential. Take a pre-fit plugger and step its working end around the circumference of the canal to scrape the walls clean and to capture the maximum cushion of rubber. The cycle concludes with a five second press. Vertically pressing on the thermal softened mass moves it laterally and vertically over a range of a few millimeters. This completely seals the root canal system three-dimensionally at this level. Note, the middle and apical extent of the cone is unaltered and has not yet been heated. Notice the cone is buckling a little bit under the loads, but most importantly, please note that the sealer would be unable to move coronally like in lateral condensation. In fact, the problem with lateral condensation might be twofold. First, we're wedging steel instruments that are tapered against tapered preparations. That's not good. That develops undesirable and deleterious loads on the root and contributes to root fractures. But probably uh, equally important, certainly, would be the loss of hydraulics. Most of the sealer in lateral condensation vents coronally into the pulp chamber. So you can see that's the clear distinction right now. We're not going to get sealer venting coronally. In fact, the sealer can only move laterally into available opening. That means tubules, lateral canals, etc. Or it could move apically around the discrepancy 
when there is a round cone and an irregularly shaped foramen. And in those instances, sealer would be driven hydraulically in that gap between the round cone and the irregular shaped foramen. This would conclude our first heating and condensation cycle. Now we bring over the heat transfer unit, cold. We set it on top of the massive gutta percha that was previously condensed. We hit the circumferential activating cuff and the instrument becomes immediately hot and plunges three or four millimeters into the coronal aspect of the gutta percha. We deactivate the activating cuff and the tip begins to cool. When we remove the instrument, the instrument is removed along with a thermal softened bite of gutta percha. Two important things have happened. One, we got another five millimeter heat wave progressively deeper through the master cone. And two, by removing the electric heat plugger and a bite of gutta percha, we can now introduce a smaller plugger that has been prefit and we can use this smaller plugger to effectively condense gutta percha into this region of the canal. Notice how the gutta percha strings up on the lateral walls. So yet again, the smaller plugger is stepped circumferentially around the perimeter of the canal. I'm often asked, well, what is the load that you put on this plugger? And I want to say to you, it's not a shoulder motion. It's not an elbow motion. It's a digital wrist type motion. It would be the same load or pressure one would use to pack amalgam into any cavity preparation. It's deliberate, it's intentional, but it doesn't require excessive forces because thermosoftened gutta percha readily adapts, molds, and moves into space. Once the walls have been scraped clean and we have the maximum bulk or cushion of rubber, we use the sustained five second press again to move gutta percha laterally and vertically over a range of another few millimeters. Again, notice the sealer would be entrapped it could not vent coronally and we would have another opportunity to fill into lateral anatomy that is present in this region of the shaped canal. Well, we come in cold with the electric heat plugger. It's activated when it hits the mass. It plunges another three to four millimeters deeper and we deactivate, hesitate a moment and remove the instrument. When we remove the instrument, we will note that there's another thermal softened bite of gutta percha on its distal end and again, two things have happened. Another heat wave brings thermal softened gutta percha right to the terminus of the cone. And by removing a bite of gutta percha, we can now use a smaller prefit plugger that was sized to work within five millimeters of length. And we can use that to mold gutta percha into the AP one third and cork this region of the canal. Again, notice how the gutta percha has strung up on the lateral walls. The prefit plugger again is stepped around the perimeter of the canal and once everything is leveled off, a sustained five second press serves to cork the foramen. And during this five seconds of pressing, please note subtly the gutta percha is going through its cooling cycle. I want to make very certain that this is uh, communicated well, but gutta percha does not shrink when there, it is loaded during the cooling cycle. Let me say it wrong. If you thermal soften gutta percha and leave the operatory, yes, it will shrink. The di key distinction, the key factor is to load the material with that five second press during the cooling cycle. Digitally, the clinician will note that the gutta percha feels hard. It's not compactable anymore. It's reduced its temperature from about 40 to 45 degrees centigrade back to body temperature, which is 37. What's remarkable is we only have to heat gutta percha three degrees over body temperature for it to be sufficiently moldable and able to be condensed into anatomical spaces. So it is the warm gutta percha technique. It's not a hot gutta percha technique. Well, if we looked at this dynamically, you can see in this simulated plastic model, notice the heat source is already thermal softening gutta percha and it's already moving deep into the lateral anatomy. Here comes the plugger coronally and here comes the gutta percha laterally. This is pretty exciting to see in this simulation because this is exactly what happens clinically. In this simulation, I did not use sealer. 
and the purpose of not using sealer was it was not used so that it wouldn't mask your view. I wanted you to very specifically notice how the gutta percha dynamically moves into space. Well, with the Apico one third corked, we can now have discussions about using the Calamus Flow injectable gutta percha system to backpack or backfill the canal. Obviously, there are other systems available that can do this task. Put the tip of the cannula on top of the previously established core. The cannula is quite warm, and by placing this hot tip against the previous gutta percha, we can re-thermal soften its most coronal extent. In this way, when we inject gutta percha in and compact it, we'll get cohesion between the segments that were injected into the canal. To eliminate voids, it's really important to emphasize on the first squirt of thermal softened gutta percha when you're far, far away from the occlusal table, please inject two or three millimeters. I'll say it wrong. If you inject four, five, six millimeters, you'll probably see on your post-operative films a little annoying void within the body of the pack canal. This is not going to diminish the prognosis but it just is something that is unsightly and we that love to do endodontics, we want to do every step to the best of our ability so a good dense pack is very nice to see on post-operative films. So the trick to avoid voids or to eliminate voids if you will is to first inject a small increment, a small aliquot of thermal soft and gutta percha. The other trick would be to really use that smallest plugger in a methodical way, step it around the perimeter of the canal very deliberately, and then again, a five second press molds that gutta percha laterally and apically into this region of the canal. That is our first backpack, or if you will, backfilling cycle. And we can inject and condense in the manner that I've spoke about and backfill the canal and typically too about the cemental enamel junction. At least that's what I used to say. Currently I'm teaching or advocating backfilling canals to the crest of bone. Uh, people are living longer, more people are putting more emphasis on tooth preservation. This means that oftentimes patients are going through periodontal procedures, sometimes flap procedures, osseous recontouring procedures, and then apically repositioned flaps. This means that teeth are translucent and we don't want to look through a translucent tooth and see a hue of pink gutta percha, especially in those patients for aesthetic reasons when there's a high lip line and when their smile reveals the tooth and the gums beyond, we don't want to see pink gutta percha emanating from any given tooth. Well, we could have stopped backpacking at any time also if prosthetics wanted to place a post for restorative reasons. So to end my discussion on warm vertical condensation, you can see in these graphics that it's a fairly simple technique. It might seem complicated because of the armamentarian involved and perhaps your unfamiliarity with it, but I can promise you over the last 30 years I've trained thousands and thousands of international dentists to do this technique and if I have about two or three hours with you, shoulder to shoulder, I can have you doing warm gutta percha within 90 days on all canals of all teeth in the mouth of the patients you serve. Best wishes as you review more about this technique in the following clinical op.